Amen. Let's stand to our feet, church. How's everybody doing today? You guys excited to come worship Jesus? A couple of you are. Let's open up with prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. God, we are here to celebrate that you're alive. Lord, we know that with the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. And God, we walk in that freedom today. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. Put your hands together.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit. Yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain, Every chain is broken. the Lord Lord, in this place, God, Lord, we're here to give you praise and glory and honor, Jesus. Come on, church, we are in this place to give God glory and praise. Can I just say something that's on my heart today is that we come in this place with so many needs and burdens and things that are going on in our life, but there's nothing like the name of Jesus. Some of us in this place, we're going through a lot. But we just need to speak the name of Jesus, amen? Come on, sing it out. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. The break every chain. Break every chain, break every Come on, declare that today, church. There's power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power.
Let's just worship this morning. Come on, lift your hands, lift your voices, and declare the name of Jesus over your life today. Oh, Jesus, there's power in your name, Jesus. Jesus, there's power, there's power. Church, just lift your voices today. Just give your affections to the King. Jesus, we love you. Oh, you're holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Lord, we're here in this place today, not for our personal gain, but Lord, to worship you and give you glory and honor. God, we're not here in this place to put on a show and to, to perform for you, Jesus. Lord, we're here to share our affections and our love and our worship to you, Jesus. Lord, in this place, God, we just declare that your freedom reigns. God, where the enemy would come in to kill, steal, and destroy, God, we know that you say in your word where the spirit of the living God is, there is freedom. And God, we just walk in that freedom right now, Jesus. Lord, that we call upon your name. That there is no name that's more powerful than the name of Jesus. Lord, that if we are sick, God, we declare the name of Jesus over our sickness. God, if we're bound, Lord, we just declare the name of Jesus over our sickness. God, if there's things going on in our life, God, that are, that are hurtful and painful, God, that we just declare the name of Jesus over our situation and over our circumstances because there's no name, no name other than your name, Jesus. No name. Come on, church, let's worship today. Oh, Jesus. Break 
chain to break every chain to break every chain break every chain in the next few moments what we're going to do is transition to a time of prayer and if you're part of the prayer team we want you to come down front right now and what we're going to do is we're going to declare Jesus to reign over each other's lives amen if you have a need, whether you're sick in body or you just have a need that you want somebody to agree with you, please come down front and we want to pray with you during the next few songs. Come on, keep on worshiping. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I'm right. 
you are more. Lord, you are more, you are more than my words would ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I may call. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. today I will sing no other name Jesus come on all across this place let's lift our hands to heaven and let's declare it today come on my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing Crazy. 
This is my song, man. It's this declaration of this is what God has done for me. This is what I'm about. I was about this, but now, after Christ intervening in my life, I'm about this. Man, what an awesome, awesome deal. It reminds me of the scripture in Revelation that tells us they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Man, how incredible. And I'm going to ask those that are going to come and, and share with you today to join me up on stage. And in that same vein, as you guys are seated this morning, man, we want to give testimony of what God has done this past week. Last week, we got up here and we said, church, would you join with us in prayer this week as we take uh, 40 plus students to camp? And man, you guys did and committed to that. And the fruit of that prayer was felt and was evident. And so today, man, I, we, we don't have time. Oh, although, Pastor, I'm sure if they were all here, you would give time for that. Um, but we don't have time for to testify of all the amazing things that God did this week. But we want to share a little bit. We want to give you a snapshot of what God did as we were at camp this week. And, and I wish, uh, man, you all could have been there to see 950 students just going hard after God. Man, just, just that in itself does something for your heart, man. It makes it swell and go, you know what? The world, man, may tell us, may paint a bleak picture. The news that I watch every night may look like the, that things are going sour and bad. But when you see 950 students going after God, you go, you know what? There's still hope because God's still moving. God's still alive in this generation. So I've asked a couple to share. And, um, man, I'm excited. You're first in line, so you get to go first. She's nervous up here, so y'all got to be nice. We all promised to be nice. They promised. Okay, here you go. Hi. Okay. So now all of y'all know, but my name's Stephanie. Um, and right now I'm freaking out. So if I stutter or anything, don't don't hate me. Well, at camp, it was just amazing to see all of those students go after God, and every one of them race to the front as soon as the band started playing. And now, for me. The sermons really hit me because he talked about unforgiveness and about purity and about just reaching out and worshiping and using your prayer language every day. Now, the main thing I want to say up here is that on Thursday, I had like a vision or a dream, and it was of a faceless girl in a deep, dark pit. 
falling and continuing to fall. When she'd get up and try to climb again, she'd grab branches, but the branches would break. She'd reach out for hands over the edge, but the hands, when she got halfway up, would let her go. And she kept falling and falling and always falling. Finally, when she was covered in blood, tired, desperate, and covered in tears, she was ready to give up and die in that dark pit. But then a new set of the new set of arms appeared over the edge, and the pit was filled with light. These arms were brighter, bigger, and stronger than the ones before. They reached down and grabbed her and started to pull her up. When she was halfway up, she started to slip and fall again. But they grabbed both her arms, pulled her out of the pit, and wrapped her in an embrace. Now, I believe that to mean that no matter when people let you down or you always falling and you feel like that you're worth nothing and you're always going to get rubbed back in the dirt, that he's always there to pick you up again and wrap you in a big old embrace. I'm Cheyenne. I'm not really that shy, so I'm not really nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this week at camp, a lot of things happen. Um, I can honestly say it was probably the best week of my life. Um, I've been to camp before, but I don't know. This week was just, it was amazing. And um, she mentioned one of the services was about unforgiveness and I'm not going to go into detail, but there's a lot of things that I've been holding on to for a long time and holding grudges against um, people in my family that have hurt me. And um, this week, God just allowed me to open up and let all that go. And I didn't realize how bad it was hurting me until I don't have it anymore. And ever since third Wednesday, when um, I bawled like a baby and <laughs> let all that go and I don't have to hurt inside anymore, and uh, I just feel overjoyed. And then on Thursday, um, he had an altar call for anyone who hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And uh, I went up, and I've been praying to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues for about three years now. And um, on Thursday, I was just standing there praying, and um, a couple people had come and prayed for me, and then there was this one person that came and prayed for me, and um, I just started speaking in tongues, and I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was shaking so bad. <laughs> when I got done, my body was, like, trembling. It was, but it was, like, the most amazing experience of my life. And uh, now I'm just filled with so much joy, and it's just awesome. <laughs> This was my uh, first year to go to camp. I was a little, little nervous at the beginning, but it was a life-changing week for me. I, um, I was definitely baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time. It's something I've been really praying about for a while now. It finally happened. And then I remember, I believe it was Wednesday, I was just praying, and Andrew came up with me and started talking with me. And then probably not five or ten minutes after that, Pastor John came up and basically said the exact same thing to me. It was just real reassurance to me that God has big things in my life for me and when I grow up. And it was just, it was, it was life changing. It was, it was great. Can't wait for next year. It was, man, God just renewed my, um, well, I guess showed me really how much I really do love to work with youth over this past week. Um, Man, it was it was awesome to be able to go and be a counselor and and be on the other side of of seeing kids just run up and go for God just with their whole hearts, you know, jumping around, praising God and and dancing and, and just having the time of their lives just praising God and 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 you know you know there was times where I'd just sit back and watch and just man, like it just it, it touched my heart and I, it, God used me big time, you know, um, I prayed for like five people, and they all received the Holy Spirit this week, and um, I guess two of them are standing right here, <laughs> so um, it was just an awesome week, God God just revealed so many things to me, He gave me such a, just a, a blessed week, uh, I, I met so many people from Southwestern, where I'm, 
know, I got my acceptance letter on my graduation from Teen Challenge that day. My parents gave it to me, and um, and I met, you know, like 30 people from Southwestern. You know, it was so awesome to just meet people and, and see the joy and just feel the feel God in, in their presence and, and know that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be at a good place when I go to Southwestern, and I have a lot of friends already to go and, and be with and, and have a great time with. And, and uh, I just love the Lord, and I, I praise Him every day, and I thank Him so much for, for the time that I had this week. It was, it was a refreshing, cleansing week, and, and uh, I love all you guys, and I, I'm just going to continue to pray with you all, and, and, and I'll always be there with you all on Wednesday night for, for a little while until I go to college. So. Um, just praise God. Thank you, guys. There's there's part of my pride that's a little bit hurt because I've prayed with them and received the Holy Spirit and they didn't. So, but uh, I guess God knew I needed that humility. Dude, this is so cool. It's like it's like four sermons standing up here, you know, saying, "Hey, when you're going through it, no matter what you go through, God's the one." When people let you down, right? I mean, that's a message in itself, right here. Hey, get get the unforgiveness out of your life. Some of you wonder why God's not moving in your life. Why you stop hearing the voice of God? Maybe there's some forgiveness issues right there. I'm not trying to preach. Don't don't encourage me. I'm just you know just, dude. God does have great stuff for your life, and not just when you grow up, but now, right? And. Man, that was cool. That was, that was, that, that's encouraging, too, because I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where God told you to say something to somebody, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure if this is... Uh, okay, you get it. And um, for another pastor to come along and say the same thing, it's cool. And um, Matt, dude, I love it. I love where God's taking you and what he's done in your life. It's, it's incredible. Thank you guys so much. I know. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal week. We had 11 baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time. We, we baptized in water eight students. And uh, I tell you, one of the, the, I mean, so many highlights this week. One of my favorite was watching my wife. Uh, I asked her, I said, hey, Angela, would you baptize the, the young ladies that I want to get baptized? And to be able to stand by my wife as she baptized them. And just, oh, yes. It's beautiful. And um, even one of the girls and that my wife baptized, uh, her and one other girl from her church came, and they were put in the dorm with our girls. And, uh, and they just became part of us, and part of part of our girls. They just welcomed them in. And so my wife got to baptize one of them. It was just a beautiful, beautiful time this week. So let me just as, as excitedly and as humbly as I can this morning say thank you, church. Thank you so much. Every single year, I get to this point in the summer, this week, this Sunday after camp, and, and it just hits me again that if it wasn't for the faithfulness and the generosity of you, man, coming to our silly little student auction and buying our students and, and coming up to me and going, hey, do you have students who can't make it? And I'm all, every year, the answer is yes. Just write the check. And the answer is always, and, and you guys do it. And you give so generously. And um, hopefully you see in this snapshot, and this is it, just a snapshot of all that God did, and that it's worth it, that your investment is worth it, that there's huge eternal dividends. And um, man, let me just say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, church, for praying. Thank you so much for supporting, and uh, just for allowing us to do what God has called us to do. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, hey, uh, let's transition a little bit, and uh, we want to we want to say thank you this morning. Uh, if you're here worshiping with us as our guest today, and hopefully you can see we're, we're a church that just loves God, pursues God, and, and loves seeing the generations after us go after God, whether it's students or kids. And, uh, and if you're looking for a church home, we pray that man, if, if it's God's will that you would find a home here and connect here. But if you're our guest, we want to say welcome. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today and worshiping God together with us, celebrating with us what God's doing in these students. And if that is you, and we just ask a small, small favor this morning. In fact, we ask everybody to do this every week. So if you haven't already, everybody just grab that care and communication card in front of you. And if you're our guest, if you'd grab that care and communication card right there in front of you and just fill it out. Let us know that you were here this morning, and oh, and when the offering comes in just a second, 
you just drop that in the offering plate this morning as our guest. And that'll be your offering this morning. And we just say thanks again for doing that. Thanks again for being our guest with us this morning. We're so thrilled uh, to have you today. And uh, the ushers are coming now to wait on us for the morning tithe and offering. So uh, if you haven't prepared to give, if you begin to give now. And as they're coming, we want to remind you that tonight is Encounter. And there's a there's a, a time every single Wednesday night, 5 o'clock, where we gather with students before our services and we pray. And on the screens in the student center, we have different things to pray for. You know, pray for the service, pray for the worship team, pray for, man, chains to be broken. These different things we pray for. Next to a few of those, we've got just some quotes. And uh, one of the quotes is from D.L. Moody. He says, every great move of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. And tonight, that's what it's all about, is just coming and kneeling before God, pursuing God, going after God. And so make time tonight to be here at 6 o'clock as we encounter God and pursue God. And we believe that out of that heart, out of that diligent seeking of the face of God, that we're going to see an incredible, incredible move of God, not only in our lives, but in our community as well. Amen? Amen. amen. So be here. If you said amen, that means you'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock. So um, it's going to be fun. It's going to be good. Can you join your hearts in prayer with me as we take up the offering? Father, thank you. Seriously, God, thank you for your hand of blessing in our life. Lord, you sustain the very breath in our lungs and got all that we do. God, we're empowered by you. And so, God, I ask, God, that even as we come to this time of offering, that, that you would take our obedience in this moment, our act of worship, God, as we give. God, and use it for your glory, God, to honor your name, or to meet the needs of your church, God, as it reaches your world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So good to see you here today. And as Pastor Andrew mentioned, thank you so much for all our guests. If you're with us today for the first time and any returning guests, really is thank you so much for being here. And, you know, summer, it's, a, it's an awkward dynamic or a weird dynamic because so many of our folk are traveling and vacationing and gone. And at the same time, we've got so many new faces every week. Amen, church. And it's really refreshing. It's awesome. And I love to be able to get to meet all of them. And hopefully you've done the same as well, because this is a family church. So church, if you haven't already met our guests, please make it a point as soon as church is out. But wait till I say amen. Uh, but as soon as I'm out, please find somebody you don't already know and get to know them. Amen, church. I, I, I love being able to hear. I, I, this is what I look forward every Sunday is to be able to share this experience with the church family. And that's, what this, that's what's here today. So thank you so much. Can we show our appreciation to all our guests right now, church? Come on. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much again just for being here. And what a week it's been. I love camp. Haven't you just enjoyed these testimonies of what God has done, but what, it, what God is doing and what God's going to do? Um, I absolutely love camp, and I always remember my camp experiences. In fact, I was called to the ministry at camp before I even knew what a call a ministry was, and I still don't even know what it is. I'm still trying to figure that out, uh, but I'm here, and it's all because of, of, of the power of God that happens when kids just get away from just world and, and get along with God. It's amazing when you get along with God what you can hear. 
him say amen because God is speaking can you say amen God is speaking he's still speaking and God is still moving and he moved this week I'm proud to say I'm a Texan and uh, I'll just I'm not going to get political but it's more of a spiritual thing guys I, I believe that what happened this week is a very 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 powerful week for the state of Texas uh, as far as conception of life being pro-life and what that's all about folks and if that offends you I don't mean to, but I know what the Word of God says. And so we took a step closer of what that's all about. And folks, I'm proud to be in Texas. Amen. <laughs> it's definitely a step in the right direction. And that's what we've been talking about. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. is standing for righteousness, standing for a way of living that is right and pleasing in the eyes of God. Amen, church. And it's, it's just a church, it's just people believing in a Bible and standing up and saying, we're not going to bow down to this culture, to what you say we have to live by. We live by the standards that's written in the Word of God. Can you say amen? And that's what it's all about. And I'm fired up today, folks. I'm not even, it's not political, it's just right. And uh, we thank God for what's going on in that. So, so I, I praise God, I really do. It's exciting times we live in. We have an opportunity these days, in these last days, to usher in a move of God that is powerful. And we have to do our part as Christians, as a church, to get right in the middle of God moving. Amen. I, when that move of God happens, and I want to be right in the middle of it. Amen, church. So, and this church will be because we're going to be on our knees before God in worship and in prayer. That's why nights like tonight and prayer night are so important. Because we, we know we're nothing without God. Where will we be without God? That's why those moments are so important. Because we humble ourselves before God. And we seek the face of our Lord and say, here we are. Speak into us. What do you have to say? And that's what today is all about. We're going to continue in our series, God. We're going to move right in to the message. Hopefully you have your, your bulletin there in front of you. If you have it, please get that out and get it ready. To follow along, we're staying right in the book of Daniel, and it's exciting. I can't wait to get into today's message. It's going to be a lot of fun, yet it's still challenging like every message has been. Today is equally as challenging, and, uh, but, but I, I love it. Amen. Don't you love when God speaks through His Word? Amen. And just tells us and shows us a way of living. How do you... The theme of all these messages, and you probably wouldn't expect it in a book of Daniel, in a prophetic book like Daniel, but nonetheless, the message is there, and the theme is, how do you live a godly life in an ungodly world? Amen? That's a question we all ask, it's a question we all face, it's something that we all strive to, is, is Lord, how do we live a godly life when everything else around us, the world we live in, is so ungodly, how, to, how do we live godly? And to, to go back to the Old Testament and to look into the book of Daniel in, in a, what's considered a prophetic book, yet there's so much history in that book. As I mentioned every week, a quick review of where we've been and where we are today, but in the book of Daniel and also the person of Daniel, we all know it's, it's, it is a prophetic book, but it's split up into two sections. The first six chapters are what we consider the historical part of it, and the last six chapters are what we consider the prophetic part of it, but there's so much prophecy throughout really the whole book which is why it's considered a prophetic book in fact we're in chapter five today and there is a powerful prophetic word that's being spoken in chapter five as well so and we hadn't even got to the prophetic part of, of daniel's dreams and all that but man what a book but that's where we're at that's where we have been for the last three weeks today is the fourth week of daniel we talked about the first week the challenge and that is in this culture, to, that, that similar to what Daniel faced back then historically, is the same thing we face today. Because the first thing the Babylonians did when they captured the Israelites and seized them and took control of their lives, which, we, which is called the captivity period or the exile period of, of Israel. During that time, the first thing they did is they tried to rename you. Amen, church? The world will try to name you, will try to label you into something that you're not. It's definitely something that uh, God has something bigger, better, and His name for you is a name we should be living up to, not what the world names you. Amen? But the Babylonian culture tried to, did rename uh, uh, several uh, of, of the Israelites, and so that's the message, and that is when the world tries to rename you, we will stand up to 
the purpose and to the will and to the name that God has for us and live in that manner. And, and that's how you live counterculturally. So that was the theme, that was the message, that was the challenge in the first week. The second week we were faced with, with, uh, with words, we started talking about a, a different thing, and that was culture's greatest test. And culture's greatest test is who will you worship? Who will you worship? And that was a huge challenge that, was, that Daniel was facing, the Israelites was facing, is you, 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 there's a crossroads in your life. You're going to worship this God, you will not worship that God. And that's the culture we live in even today. And the, and the fight and the struggle for all of our lives every day is who will you worship? And it goes beyond the very act of worship. It's more than just singing songs and clapping and, and dancing and whatever. It, 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 yes, that demonstration is incredible and, and that's good. But this transcends just an act of worship. It's the lifestyle of worship. Who will you worship? And if you haven't already faced that already, folks, the day is coming when that question is going to be ever more in the middle of your grill your face there and the question is who you're going to worship and it could cost you your life and it has for many people around the world amen and so that's the challenge with that is who will you worship and what what answer will you will you go there and we talked about in the book of mark the test that i brought you guys to as far as loving the lord with all your heart soul mind and what strength and so we passed the test answering those questions last week we went into culture's greatest sin and we talked about culture's greatest sin which is the same that it was for king nebuchadnezzar it's the same thing that creeps into all of our lives and it's that that sin of pride and really what it comes down to is it's a choice we have to make it's either humility or humiliation one of the two is going to happen in our life and god has a way of bringing that to to light doesn't he folks and and today we're going to move right into today's message i briefly took you through the first uh, three weeks of Daniel, and today we're going to be talking about culture's greatest culprit. Today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different, and we're going to talk about the handwriting on the wall. And it's more than just a colloquialism or a saying that's been around for a long time. We've said it, and many I'm sure that a lot of people don't even know that that came out of Daniel chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall. And when you, when you hear that in social circles, when you hear that today at church, you, you know where your mind goes, and that is... That means there's imminent danger. There's a warning there. The handwriting's on the wall. It's telling you something is coming, and, and it's there to bring your attention to something. Amen? That's, that's the saying. That's the colloquialism. That's what it means, but it's so much more than just a saying. It's an actual event that happened in, in the life of Daniel as well, and we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5 talking about warning signs because prophetically, God has some warning signs for all of us here today. Can you say amen? And that's in following a line of where we've been in, in the book of Daniel. Today, God is going to give us and usher us some warning signs that are there because there's some warning signs that have definitely been issued to, uh, not to King Nebuchadnezzar because the, uh, he's already gone. His son is actually the one that's taken over, and it's Belshazzar is the one that's taken over, and his son is the one who's king right now, and Belshazzar uh, there's so much we're going to learn from this guy because God issued warning signs to him. Literally, the handwriting was on the wall. So that's where we're going to be today in, in Daniel chapter 5. If you guys are with me, say amen. Let's start in verse 1. It says, King Belshazzar, Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. And this is symbolic of that carefree life. So when you see this in Scripture, it's more than just a very act of just drinking. It's more than that. It's the symbolism of that caref carefree life. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that's what we see here with Belshazzar. So while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets. This is a very significant. We'll get to that in a minute. He, bring, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Th this is taking the holy things, things that were set aside for holy, and taking those and disrespecting that. Okay, and then that's, again, that's our culture that we live in today, church. So pay attention to the words here. There's so much within the lines that's written in there that we live in today. So they brought in the gold goblets that has been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the, the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. 
Suddenly, here's the message, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. Let's stop and pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you. Lord, my my spirit is overwhelmed today, Lord, because there's such a powerful message for us today. All of us, Lord, need to heed the warnings you have for us, God. Lord, I just pray for these next few moments that you'll just speak through us, Lord, through your word, through your written word that we're reading and breaking into today, but also, Lord, your spoken word. Because I believe you're speaking into lives even right now as I pray. Lord, your prophetic word is being ushered today, Lord. We need to do what we can to eliminate any distractions and to listen and to hear your voice. So, Father, right now, even as I speak, even as I bring the word today, I pray that your prophetic word would be spoken. Speak into our lives and to our hearts today, God. We ask you to bless these next few moments. We ask this in your name. Everybody says, amen, amen. Thank you so much for praying with me on that. The handwriting on the wall, the warning. And as before I get into the, the, the three warnings that are in this message today and what this message is all about, let me just talk to you a little about what brought us to this point. Because we're going to skip through a few verses and get to about verse 22. But before we get there, the, the king, Belshazzar, of course, noticed there's handwriting on the wall. And immediately he's like, okay, what does this mean? And he's seeking interpretation for what exactly, what does this stand for? What does this mean? And, and the queen, or, 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 he went and said, listen, I, I know a guy. He, he's, this is the woman talking to Belshazzar. I, I know a guy that, and he served your father. And this guy can interpret. This guy can take this and he'll give you the meaning for it this guy is good he he's proven himself time and time again he served your father listen you got to get this guy because he's already called magicians and those an enchanter i mean all, all these guys he's called all these people none of them can interpret that uh and, and so they said go get daniel this guy can interpret your dream and this guy can interpret this and he can he can tell you if there's signs of trouble so he brings in Daniel and Belshazzar looks to Daniel and says, okay, if you can give me the, the interpretation, if you can tell me what this means, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a nice purple robe and I'll give you this. And I'll, I mean, all these promises of all these things he's going to do from Daniel says, listen, you can keep all that. I don't want it, but I'm still going to interpret for you. I'm going to tell you what this means. But in, here, here's the bold part about this. When you get to this, Daniel even says, you can keep that. I don't want your stuff. But before I even tell you what this means, let me tell you a little bit about yourself. And you can see some incredible boldness coming out of Daniel's mouth saying, Listen, brother, your dad did the exact same thing you're doing right now. You're living a carefree life. You're disrespecting things in the temple. You're doing this. You're you're doing everything wrong. And this is pretty much a warning from God. If you don't change your ways like your dad was was warned about, there's going to be the handwriting's on the wall. There's going to be death for you. There's going to be some bad things happening for you down the road. So listen up. That's the gist of what happened in the next few verses. So when we get to verse 22, some things will make sense to you. You guys ready? Say amen. So in your notes, let's go into Daniel chapter 5, verses 25. Actually, is what we'll jump to. We'll jump to verse 25, and it says, This is the inscription that was written. And to my, to my understanding, and I, I might be a little wrong if someone can correct me later, some of these scholars, but I... I've done the research, and this was not a language that was native to anybody. It wasn't really an actual language. These words that came out, only Daniel can interpret them because only God is the one that made these words up. So here's the words. It, it's, this is what was written. Many, many, tikol parsen. And I don't know how to pronounce those, so there's the Edgar version of it. This is what these words mean. Uh, many or mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You catch that? The meaning of the first word is God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. So number one is we forget that our days are numbered. There's the first warning. The first warning to all of us, which is the same warning that was to Belshazzar back then, is we forget that our days are numbered. Let me let me let me say to you this way, guys. Any anything we think we have a lot of, we tend to squander. That's kind of human nature, isn't it? If we think we have a lot of something, then our attitude is we don't mind squandering that. We don't mind 
parting ways with some of that because after all we have a lot of it so it's okay if we lose things here and there from time to time the same attitude applies on the opposite so anytime we think we have a limited a number of something we seem to hold tight to that we, we use it wisely don't we the book of james tells us that our life is just a mist so if we stay with that attitude guys the challenge in that is and, and remember i don't know if you remember this about almost three years ago, I shared with you a message that's called 30 Days to Live. And you might have already read the book and gone through that experience. But when it, that came down to two questions. If you were given just 30 days to live, okay, the first question is, what will you start doing that you're not already doing? What will you start doing that you're already not doing? And the second question, that is, what will you stop doing that you are doing? Take those principles, take those questions, and apply it to this principle. Because Scripture clearly tells us that our days are numbered. We don't know when our end is near or coming, or it could be even today. And if you live with that type of attitude, folks, I promise you, you'll change the way you live. Hello? Folks, you guys with me today? It's a very, very powerful message to that, because I dare you to take those two questions and see if that doesn't change your life today. You're saying, well, I've never been faced with that kind of report. Then start living like you've been faced with that kind of report because the report's just been given to you. God says, without even trying to hear a doctor's report, God's already telling you, your days are numbered. You don't know your end. So what will you start doing that you're already not, and what will you stop doing that you are doing? That's the attitude we need to live by every day of our lives, and that's the warning that's out there for all of us, guys, is our days are numbered. Don't forget your days are numbered. Quit living that carefree life, which is what Belshazzar was doing. Oh, I'm just going to live it up. I'm going to do what I can. I've got plenty of time. I'm young after all, so I've got tons of time out there. Folks, you don't. Are you listening to me today? This isn't a scare tactic, folks. I don't have that kind of ability to scare you into believing in the God. The, the handwriting's on the wall. It's, the message is already there. Our days are numbered. How will you live your life knowing that today? Can you say amen? Moving right along, number two, verse 27 of chapter 5 says, Tekel, or Tekel, or whatever, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You can underline, circle, highlight the word weighed there, because that's where we get the second challenge or the second warning on that. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Number two is we allow our lives to get out of balance. That's the second warning. We allow our lives to get out of balance. Look at your life every day and, and measure how you spend your life. Folks, I don't know if you've ever done this. I, I've done this myself, and, and I take inventory from time to time, which is very convicting. I'm just warning you right now, you need to do this, but when you do it, just be ready to be amazed and astounded of where you spend your time in a daily, just in a, in a year's time. Maybe in a week, take a week and maybe, and, and take, you know, every week for about a month, measure out your time, and then multiply that by 12, and you'll get, a, you'll get an average of where you spend your time. Just to have a little uh, fun here today to kind of break the ice a little bit, because I know this is an intense message, but I'm going to read to you some startling numbers, some facts for you, and, and this is the average American person, this is how a, an average American will spend their time in a lifetime. Okay, you guys ready for this? Say Amen. Here's the first one. The average American will eat out 14,411 times. Did you catch that? The average American, some of you are shaking your head. It's just an average, folks. Some of you probably are a little higher, some are less. Um, I'm not going to say anything because I eat out too. But 14,411 times. Here's the next one for those of you who are raising smaller children. 1,811 of those times are at McDonald's. Okay, so I'm just... I just made some of you throw up in your mouth just now, didn't you? You're like, Whoa. okay, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay, moving right along. The next number is this one. 13 years and four months are watching TV. Okay, moving right along. I wanted that to marinate a little bit, and then you can slip on a grill later. Okay, 13 years, four months watching TV. Let that, let that soak in, because that one, that one was pretty startling. In fact, for some, it's probably a lot more than that. Listen, guys, you know how the law of averages goes. That means there's going to be something way up here and something down here. So just to figure there's probably even a number higher than that, just very startling, okay? 
you're thinking, what a complete waste of time. I can think of a lot of places I'd rather be for 13 years than sit in front of a television. Nonetheless, there's your averages, folks. The next one is, this one kind of bothered me, five years are spent waiting in line. It's a waste of time. Now, I've been to Disney World and Disneyland many times, and I can attest to that. It felt like an eternity waiting in line, okay? So there you go. Five years of your life are spent waiting in line, no matter what. Here's the next one that'll probably, again, wake you up a little bit. We spend one year looking for misplaced items. Some of you a lot longer because you're blonde hair. Okay, let's go right along. One year looking for misplaced items. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. I uh, just lost about 50% of you. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, it's we have in a lifetime, we would have attended 35 weddings. In a given lifetime, we would have attended 35 weddings. For someone like me, is a whole lot more than that. Obviously, it's kind of what I do. Uh, but some of us would have, and maybe already, some of you guys probably already stood in probably 35 weddings, haven't you? Um, I don't know. Uh, the next one is, this one, this one will wake you up a little bit. In a given lifetime, we would have driven 627,000 miles. That's 25 times around the greatest part of the earth. Uh, it's 25 times around the earth. That's pretty startling. Some of you feel like you've done that road trip this summer, haven't you? Especially if you're raising kids. You think, I feel like I've just driven 600,000 miles with my kid in the car, especially if you don't have the Nobel Peace Prize winning item, and that's a DVD player in your car, right? So those of you who are raising children, get something that will entertain your kids or sing along or something. That's what we do in our car with Stephanie. I don't, Gabby's not in here. She can tell you. We have Stephanie in our car, so um, we sing a lot. We sing show tunes, people. Just going to leave it at that. Phantom of the Opera, it doesn't matter. We're singing it. Our kid can sing Phantom of the Opera when he was five. I don't, not every kid can say that's very embarrassing, but that's, that's where we're at. Please don't tell her, because I still want to eat lunch today, so uh, we don't need a DVD player. We got Stephanie, so um, startling numbers, though, isn't it? You know the prophetic warning in that is here, catch this, this is the, here's the heart behind why I'm sharing all this today. The prophetic warning is this, guys. If we don't stop the constant push for more in our life, listen to me, guys. And I, I, I'm not here to hurt feelings, but here's, here's the message. If we don't stop this constant push for more, it's going to destroy you. That's the bottom line. Um, and, and, and here's the next startling fact, which every pastor in the world can attest to this. Some of us get to a point where we cut church out to make things fit. I know you guys are really loving me today. And um, if you think today's not Pastor Appreciation Day, because I just lost that one. Okay. But in all seriousness, so folks, we, this is a, 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 a scary trend that we've seen too many times is, and many families are faced with that choice, well, something's got to give. More times than not, it's usually God and or church. And we're standing back going, what just happened? And then they come in our office when the family's falling apart, and I want to say, but how, why did you cut God out of the equation? Of course, you can't say that, but it's so easy, folks. And listen, I'm right there with you. I'm a pastor, and the same demands are on my family as well. Our kids are very involved in their school, very involved in extracurricular activities. I get that. But folks, again, that's what culture is trying to dictate to you and lie to you and tell you that you have to do all these things or you're not going to be this person. Again, do you see what that is? That goes back to the first week. It's the world labeling you. Hello? If you allow the world to label you, then that's what you're going to live up to. Folks, you don't have to do that. Listen, folks, I love you. I hope you understand. I love you very much. But the message and prophetic warning is just that. I'm not making this up. Read it for yourself. The constant push to do more and more and more is going to destroy you. And as a pastor, to sit back and watch family after family after family being destroyed, at one point, do you stand up and say, enough already, enough. It's painful to watch. Nothing about that is funny to me right now. I know we've had some fun, but this is not fun. It's not fun, is it, church? Let's move right along. Daniel 5, 28. The next word is Perez. Perez. And it's, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Here, and this is how each one builds up to this third one right here, guys. If you don't realize that your days are numbered, okay, I think we established that. If you don't realize your days are numbered, and number two is, 
And if you don't get your life in balance, then this third principle is going to happen in your life. And, and it, it'll divide you. It'll divide your marriage. It'll divide your family. It'll divide your finances. It'll divide your health. It'll divide the peace in your life. Is anybody living there today? Folks, am I preaching it or not? This is exactly what happens when the first two, it, it, it grows and it builds on to this third one. The third one is this. In your notes, we ignore the warning signs. We ignore the warning signs. And that's the whole message right there in chapter 5. Because the handwriting on the wall was a huge warning sign, is what it was saying. Let's, let, me give you, let me just issue a few warning signs right there. Stress. Can I, can I ask for a little bit of both? How many has ever dealt with stress in your life? Raise your hand. I'll raise mine. Wow. And it isn't meant to be funny, folks. I mean, it's a, it's a reality of life. Stress, marriage problems, health, again, a family divided, pain. Uh, of course, when you're dealing with a fam- or, or health or, or a family or anything that's divided, there's a lot of pain that's involved in that, isn't there? For those of you who are in a, in a medical world, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, in your body, when you're experiencing pain in your body, it's because that's a warning sign that something's not right. Amen? It's the same thing spiritually. If there's, if there's pain involved in your life and the absence of peace is in your life, that's a warning sign that something's not right. Are you, are you hearing me today? That's, that's the, those are the warning signs. Can, can, I, can I take a little, let, let's go a little bit real with you, and, and like I haven't already. Let me make it even more real to you. Let me give you some spiritual symptoms with spiritual implications. Let me bring it real to you right now, okay, folks? Let me, let me just take a little, little detour on this. When we're overstretched, listen to me on this one, because this one will, will speak to you. When we're overstretched, the risk of sinful choices increases. Okay? Do you catch that? When we're overstretched, the risk of sinful choices increases, which means we're tempted more. That's why a lot of people who are stressed out and stretched out beyond all reason, that's why you see them fall left and right. Hello? Some of us might be there even today. And that's the message today, folks. Here's the other one. Emotions are inconsistent. If any of this nails you in the forehead today, then we're going to have time again for prayer because I believe God's a big God that can take care of all this. That's the, meth- that's the great part about all this. Amen? The warning signs are there for a reason because you have a God who says he can bring the growth back. He, he can change all this. Emotions are inconsistent. Has is, is anybody ever been there before? Okay? You're less productive either at work or at home. Any of those symptoms ring a bell with anybody. Less productive, which means the, that that's where the principle of the Sabbath is very important, church. That's why you have to take some time off. You're saying, but I, I can't, folks. Then get another job. Do something different where you can. That principle of the Sabbath is very, very important. Fridays for me, Friday's my Sabbath. I try my best to make sure that I keep that day sacred for my family's sake if anything, for Edgar's sake, because if I'm no good to pastor this church because I'm stretched out and I don't take a Sabbath, then I did you an injustice. And I did not practice what I've been preaching is take a break. Take a day. Take an hour. To whatever it takes. Guys, there's so much in that, guys. Because God wants us to be productive people. If you're productive, then you can change the world. I've only known the world changes are people who are productive, not non-productive. You with me on that? We can change the world. Here's another one. And this one is probably, to me, the most dangerous symptom and also the implication. If you can't hear God, then your world's not quiet enough. Hello? Guys, my heart truly bleeds on this one because this is probably an issue and a question I get a lot through texts, phone calls, people popping in the office, going, Pastor, I'm I'm not having peace in my life. I can't seem to hear God. The number one question is, then, then your world's not quiet enough. Do something to change something in your life to allow to listen to the voice of God. Folks, are you with me on that? If, if you go to Psalms, uh, Psalms 46, one says, be still and know that I am what? God. Be still and know that I am God. There's something to that, isn't it, church? Start today. Get somewhere 
Eliminate the distractions out of your life. Be still and know that I am God. Then you'll hear the whisper. And listen, God's whisper is powerful. It's thunderous to me. Have you ever heard the whisper of God? If you haven't, stop and listen. Because to me, some of the most powerful moments I have ever had in my prayer time is when I've eliminated all. I, in fact, I've even shut out music. I'm sitting there in the stillness of God. And to hear that booming, thunderous voice whisper into my ear. Folks, there's nothing like it in the world. No experience like it. I'm being quiet for a reason now because I want you to practice that. There's something about being still and knowing that you're that he's God. If you're in this place today, can I take a little time out? Maybe this is the prophetic coming out. Maybe you're in this place today and the there's definitely an, an absence of peace in your life. Create peace. Be still and know that I am God. That's for somebody here today. Somebody need to hear that. Be still and know that I am God. Amen, church. Are you with me right now? Somebody need to hear that today. Please receive that. So here's the um, here's the application. Here's if we haven't already been real these last last thirty minutes, and here's the real part. Here's here's your take home. Here's the turning point. Are you with me? Say amen. If you jump to Daniel chapter uh, still in chapter five verses twenty nine through thirty one, here's what here's what can happen, and I'm hoping that that's not what will happen, but here's what can happen because. Belshazzar did listen to the warnings and listen to what happened here. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom, which he did not want or even ask for. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. There's your warning sign. And yet you had a person who didn't listen. Did you know that, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, folks, because here's, again, this is not Edgar talking, please. Read chapter 5, you can read it for yourself. There's a moment in there where Daniel says, your dad knew better and you know better. He even, he called him out. You know better because you watched your dad do the very same thing. He's saying, Belshazzar, you can change your ways. The handwriting's on the wall, listen to the warnings. And he didn't. And you see what can happen. Amen, church? I'm proclaiming today it's not going to happen to you. Because we're a church, we're a body of believers that are going to listen to the voice of God and listen and, and, and heed those warning signs and turn our life. Oh, here's these turning points. You guys with me? Say amen. The first one is this. Live with a sense of purpose and urgency. This is the take home. Here's what you take home today and start, start living it today. Live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Listen to Psalms 39, verses 4 and 5. It says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Again, guys, this isn't Edgar's words today. It's, it's in Scripture. Remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. And an entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence, but a breath. Folks, live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Start today. I promise you, if this is the attitude we live our life with, it'll change your life. It'll change the way you parent. It'll change your relationship with your spouse. It'll change your relationship at work. Folks, are you with me today? It'll even change even our attitude and our worship in God's house. I promise you. It, it, this, this applies to every area in our life. If we live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Can you say amen? There's a, um, there was a quote that I heard out of all places. I heard it in a movie. And I, but I, it, it spoke to me, believe it or not. And here's the quote that I've, I've, I've even said it, and I've even used it in a couple of graduation speeches. But this actually can apply to this. Your life is an occasion. Rise to it. Your life is an occasion. Rise to it. That's it right there, folks. Your life is an occasion. Rise to it. Which means... Live your life with a sense of purpose and urgency. Amen? 
Number two is put first things first. Put first things first. Matthew 6, which we all can quote, says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these what? All these things will be given to you as well, or will be added unto you if you're in the King James Version. I like that. Putting first things first. Can I give you another quote to live by? Here's another Edgarism, if you will. And it's just three words. Order determines capacity. Okay? I'm a quote person. I promise you, this quote right here will change your life. Order determines capacity. What order are you living your life in? If we're not putting God first, I guarantee you there's not going to be room for God later on down the road. Again, do the homework I gave you a while ago and try to put your life in, in, in a number. Try to measure out your life. Again, if order determines capacity, where is God in that order? If we put God in that or in order as far as putting first things first, your capacity to be a giver financially is through the roof. You can talk to, don't take my word for it, talk to anybody in this room who is a giver right now, and they can tell you how their life has been transformed and changed. And then being gener generosity is not a big thing for them. Why? Because God provides. Hello? I knew it would get quiet in there, folks, but you want to give, you make, let me give you a little financial freedom key to success right there for free. I'm not even going to charge you $19.95 for it, okay? Put first things first. Order determines capacity. If you want more at the end of the month to be able to do more, then put God first. How about in your health? How about in your life? How about in your marriage? Put God first. I promise you, your spouse will love you and think you hung the moon. Why? Because you're putting God first. Order determines capacity. Don't take my word for it. Practice it. See what happens. I promise you, it'll change your life. Those three words right there. Put first things first. You guys with me? Say amen. Folks, this is a powerful word today. Not because of me. It's, it's, it's powerful within itself. Johnny, would you guys come? Let me close with this one. Number three is, get ready for this. This is, this is I'm telling you, this, this is something else right here, okay? Life changing. I can't believe I even came up with this. Do it now. I know. He's like, man, you really studied hard for that one. Seriously, do it now. Sammy has been waiting, waiting, and waiting for the right moment to do something. You think, I, I know God's calling me to do this, and I feel the Lord really calling me to do that, but I mean, I, I, I'm really waiting for God's timing on that. God's saying, if you step out, I'll supply it. You think, we're doing this right here. I, ugh, I, don't, I don't know. Let me, because I'm scared of heights. I'm the same way. I, spiritually, I've done the same thing. I went up to the, you know, I went up to the Empire State Building. I never left the elevator. I stood at the wall like this. I mean, man, New York's a great view, Stephanie. You go on and enjoy it. I'm doing this right. But spiritually, we do that. We're, we're scared to get out of the elevator and see what's actually at the edge there because we're like, I'm, I'm not really sure. There's too much risk in that. God's saying, if you step out, I'll supply it for you. And listen, he, he doesn't call the equip. He equips the what? Hello? Just step out and do it, folks. Do it now. If you wait around for the stars and the planets to align and stuff, it's, you're going to be waiting for an eternity and might not ever do it. It won't happen. God says, I, I, do it now. Don't wait. You want to start a Bible study where? Do it. You think, I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go feed the homeless. I don't know how. Show up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and see what happened, folks. And that's a true story. I took a group of kids on a mission trip now eight years ago. This is eight years ago. I took a kids on a mission trip and we encountered a pastor who on a Sunday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, they go out in the streets on Sunday and go feed the homeless and they come back to church and they bring a lot of them with them. I was like, man, this is a great idea. I didn't have to even say the words. The kids came up to me and says, Pastor, we, I mean, Pastor Edgar, we like to do that. We want to start feeding the homeless in Houston. All right? I said, I know a perfect place. I was like, right over the uh, Pierce Elevated, there's a bridge in Houston. I can, I can guarantee I can count about 50 or 60 of them right there that'll show up if we show up with sandwiches. So we did. I just kind of helped them along. They started packing sandwiches. We showed up one day. We had 70 people show up. All, they, all we had was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but you would think we gave them a Christmas morning meal. 
Did you know that that carried on Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? I am long gone from humble now. I'm not even their youth pastor anymore. And there's still a group of kids every Sunday morning who get up, they cook breakfast, go to downtown Houston, and they feed now 120 homeless people every day. Come on, folks. Those are kids changing people's lives because they decided, I'm going to do it now. Pastor Andrew talked to Blaine a while ago. There was no, there was no accident in there, guy. Can I tell you, you can be a life changer now. Not just you, but for every young person, you can do it now. Think about the craziest thing, Blaine, you can possibly think. I, I want you to be so scared that you almost need diapers, okay? I'm, I'm saying, I want, to be, I want you to be that scared. That's the kind of dream God wants you to have. If it doesn't scare you, it's not worth even doing. And I love you, but that message is free. Listen, there's some things that scare the mess out of me. Coming up here and doing this scares me every Sunday. It's not in me to do this. I, my, my parents are here. They can tell you. I'm the shyest little Mexican in the world. I had to write letters to get girls to go out with me. I'm telling you, folks. I don't, I can't do this. Do you hear me? I can't do this. The key word there is I. There's so much he can do if we allow God to do it. A group of students can go feed 120 homeless people in Houston, Texas, eight years running. How many ministries have we started and not finished in like a two, three weeks? That's a ministry by students that's still going on today, eight years later. It can happen. We can change Longview if we do it now. Would you stand to your feet with me today? I'm excited, church. I'm beyond excited, actually. Let me take that back. Why am I excited? Because I'm, I'm looking out in a congregation of world changers. I, I, believe, I, I truly believe that about you. I wouldn't have wasted my time on this message. Man, there's so many messages that are a lot funner. It's not even a word. A lot more fun to preach than this one right here, but this one's a powerful one. Because I'm telling you, these are the type of messages that we take hold of. We get inspired, we get encouraged, and we decide, oh, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to step out and do it. Culture's greatest culprit is just put it off for tomorrow. There's, you live that carefree life. That's the message. You catch that today? That's culture's greatest culprit is to get you to do something, to get you to live up to something that you're not, to do something that you can't. That, that's the world lying to you. Do you hear me? God's got a greater purpose for you. Teenagers all the way up to season. Praise the Lord. God's got something incredible for you today. The question is, what is that for you? What is that for you? Life's an occasion, rise to it. Amen? Let's bow our heads today. Hmm. These next few moments are very important, folks, so please, no stirring around. We've, I've got plenty of time. I, I'm, I'm wrapping up now. I just got a couple of questions. The first question is this. If you're here today, I need you to pray in church. If you're here today, under the sound of my voice, you're thinking, man, that's, that message spoke to me today because I've, I've even put off even giving my life to God. Maybe pride, which is I talked about last week. Maybe it's a pride thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's just availability. I, I, for whatever reason, you've been putting off giving your life to God. And the question is, you can do that today. Would you like to? And if you would, can I pray with you? Is anybody here today, we bold enough to raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to God today. Anybody here? I don't know looking thank you Lord okay I see one hand back there thank you brother thank you man that's awesome that makes it worth it for me that was worth showing up today folks anybody else thank you Jesus thank you here's the next question church 
If you're experiencing any of these symptoms that I talked about, stress, overstretched, marriage, your family, your finances, your health, if, if any of those things apply and you do know the spiritual implications to that, can I tell you there's a hope out there for you today? The answer is Jesus. So the question, if that's you today, you're saying, I, 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 the handwriting's on the wall for me. Man, one, at least one of those things really hit home, and I, I just need prayer today. Would you remember me in prayer, Pastor? I'm willing to raise my hands. Anybody here today? Thank you. Folks, there's hands all over the building, so you're not by yourself, I promise you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. For, you can put your hands on anybody else. Thank you. Man, this is awesome. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Can we do, folks, let, let's pray right now. I want you to pray with me. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. I'm not going to ask you to repeat. I, I, can I just, I'm going to pray for you for every hand that went up. I'd love to pray for you right now. The rest of us, would you just, as I pray, would you pray your own prayer? Pray it over yourself. Saying, God, give me the strength. Give me the, give me the power. I want to step out and do it now, God. I, I don't want to give in to that late. I don't want to give in. I want to do it now. I want to live up to the name and the purpose that you've called me to be and to do. So right now, would you pray? I'm going to pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you. God, thank you. I love you, God, so much. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, because that's what changes life even now, God. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that we can have life. I pray for that hand that went up a while ago, Lord, that, that they would accept you as their Lord and Savior once and for all. That, God, right now, that today they leave this place with a new sense with a new sense of purpose and urgency because they are your child, God. And we celebrate that today, God. Thank you for that hand. Lord, I pray for the other hands that went up all over this building, Lord. That, Father, Lord, there's a warning sign that's there in our life that maybe we've been putting off and maybe we didn't even realize that the handwriting was on the wall. And so, Lord, I pray right now for every hand, even mine, Lord, has went up. Lord, mine goes up because I don't want to ignore any warning sign that's out there, God. I want to be able to see it, Lord God, to heed to these warnings and to live my life with a new sense of purpose and urgency, Lord God. And there's something that you're calling me to do, regardless of how scary it might seem, God. I pray that by your power, Lord, that we would step out and do it now, God. Do it now, God. Do it now. God, thank you for this. Thank you for this church family, even for the guests that are with us today for the first time or the second time. Lord, I thank. I'm so thankful for every person that's here today. I don't believe it's an accident that we're here today, Lord. So, Father, we heed to your word today. We take it to heart, and we're going to apply it and change the world. We ask this in your name, and everybody says. Amen. Church, can we give him a round of applause? Amen. Come on. He deserves it. I love you guys very much. Go be the Smiths. Go and change the world. Come back tonight. We've got Encounter Night, a great time of worship and prayer you don't want to miss. Come back. Enjoy your family today, guys. Love you.